Well, good evening, church. A lot to cover tonight, a lot of ground in the scriptures, not only historically, contextually, and my prayer each time I preach, teach, and speak is that you would take away something practically, that you would be able to apply the principles of faith to your personal and public life, right? Because the gospel is a public truth, which means it shouldn't be disconnected from our public life. I think we've erred greatly by believing the lie that faith can be compartmentalized, that it is something separate from my week. It's a Sunday thing. It's a church thing. It's a youth group thing. But the Bible knows nothing of an incongruent application of faith in our public life. So I want to start off tonight's message back in the book of Daniel chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 specifically, taking my cue from last Thursday with a message entitled, God over government. And we looked at the rule of integrity. Now you might ask, what is the rule of integrity? Well, it's very simple. It's that integrity rules. In every circumstance, in spite of any consequence, in every scenario, every situation, integrity rules. Now integrity isn't just honesty. Integrity, biblically, is being tethered to truth. And when I say tethered to truth, I'm talking about not just hearing the word, but being a doer of the word. Tethered to truth, but also not neglecting that our commission is to be launched in love, right? There's no separation between love and truth in the midst of the word integrity. It is a perfect blend, and I would even say there's a tension between the two because I have to know what I should lead with, whether, whether I lead with truth but never neglecting love, or whether I lead with love and compassion and empathy but not neglecting truth. The Christian and the church, because of their integrity. Now, when I say the Christian and the church, hear me. I'm not talking about the American Christian. I'm talking about the Christian who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And when I say church, I'm not talking about perhaps even our cultural idea of church in America. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the true believers throughout history who have contributed more to society than anyone else. Why? Because we understand we have the textbook based on the context of life, morality, sexuality, and integrity. So we care more about people's souls because we understand there's an eternity after the temporal life. But we don't neglect the physical man or the physical woman. Again, there's this, this lie that because we're leading with the spiritual health that we're completely neglecting the physical health. That's not true. I care more about people's physical health because I care about their eternal health. Christians contributed to society, and yet, regardless of that testimony, the non-believing world, and I'm using that term to describe those who are at odds against God, those who are in the rebellious state against God. The non-believing world seeks to oppose righteousness, righteous behavior, righteous ways. Why? Because righteousness very simply exposes lawlessness. I mean, Jesus said that this is the judgment, that the light has come and men loved darkness. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Anybody that hates the light is, is because they're hiding something. They, they don't want accountability. See, light does two things. We know light expels darkness. The moment you turn on your light switch, darkness has no say in whether or not it can stay. It has to flee. When darkness flees, it's because light was turned on. Let your light so shine. Let your light so shine. But there's another interesting response to light. Light exposes. Right, you ever lifted up a rock and underneath those insects, they go where? They go a-running. And that's ultimately what happens with the non-believing world. When you stand for righteousness, your righteous behavior exposes lawlessness. And of course, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, catch this. We know that we are, us Christians, of God, born of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I mean, there's a very real enemy, a devil, the accuser, Satan, Lucifer, son of the morning. He disguises himself as light. He's a very real enemy, and he is the puppet master on the non-believing world. 
He is the one that has so many deceived, so many in ignorance, not even recognizing that Satan is leading them to, to their death. He's leading them astray. And yet this is why the non-believing world would conspire to manipulate the laws of any land, and this is history, to entrap who? The faithful. Those who declare righteousness. It's no surprise that we are in a current context in our country where righteous behavior is unlawful and unlawful behavior is actually commendable. This is Isaiah chapter five, verse 20. It's very simple. It says, woe to those who call evil good, good evil, who put light for darkness and darkness for light, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who call a man a woman and a woman a man. When we call what is good, evil, and wrong, and when we look at what is evil and we call it good, right, the world would have us believe certain buzzwords, inclusivity, we're inclusive, we accept all, we're, we're tolerant. You Christians, you're judgmental, you're bigots, you are the haters. We're about diversity, right? I don't know any other word that is more biblical than diversity. Diversity, I mean, look at Revelations. When Pastor Matt eventually gets there, we're gonna see all types of people around the throne room. God is about diversity. Yet, we are supposed to come to him. We come to Christ and the ground is leveled and our external differences, they might not qualify us, but nor do they disqualify us. It's not like God completely erases our external distinctness However, diversity is found in the body of Jesus Christ. Different people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, all one race, the human race, coming together to worship one God. Amen. Yet the world would say to you, no, we're about unity. And it's interesting when you look at it because the world's invitation to unity is actually an invitation to conformity. Right, and if you don't unify, you will be vilified. If you don't fall in line, you will be the target. You will be the object of their animosity. This is the non-believing world. This is an age-old scheme of the devil. He has a playbook. He runs the same plays, the same strategies, and he is forcing the godly, that's you and I, to make a decision. Choose between God or government. It's always gonna be that way, it has always been that way. Now, notice one thing. These ideologies, these philosophies, these political strategies are always atheistic in nature. Secular humanism, progressivism, socialism, communism. You want to know why? Atheistic in nature, absent of God, then the system or the institution, which is man-made, becomes the highest form of authority. And the government wants you to submit to it there's no other higher authority for a man-made institution. And thus, here's their strategy. They pit the state of government against the state of the church. Enter in, insert in the American context what is known as separation of church and state, which is falsely defined and wrongly applied. And I am tired of seeing people comment, separation of church and state, the pulpit isn't for politics. I'm tired of it. And this is my warning to you out there to stop typing and push delete. because there would be no state without the church. And the reason why they want us to believe separation of church and state is so we stay in our little Christian bubble. We stay on the sidelines. We don't get involved in politics. Politics being defined rightly, the affairs of any given city. I care about the affairs of this community in Ocean City. I care about the affairs of every community in South Jersey. I care about the affairs of the state of New Jersey. I care about the land that God has ordained me to live in. The second strategy, if it's not separation of church and state, it's submission of church to state. Daniel 6, verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We can't trip him up in his public life. He is an upstanding 
man. He's got integrity. He's blameless. We can't trip him up in his private life. His conduct's in order. But I got a plan. If we can get Daniel to be up against the law of his God, have it conflict with the law of our land, we got him. And it wasn't like we hope that he fails. They knew that he was not going to compromise. Believers answer to one authority. And hey, in case you're hearing what I did not say, government is God's idea. It's a divine given institution when properly applied. Romans chapter 13, we are supposed to choose God over government whenever the government mandates any type of actions that are in direct violation to his law, Daniel chapter one. And they refused to what? Defile themselves. They were unwilling to compromise. That was the beginning of seeing these three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, teenagers taken from their homeland in Babylon, now surrounded by paganism and surrounded by hedonism and unwilling to fit in, unwilling to conform, unwilling, though they were in Babylon, to allow Babylon to live inside of them. In Daniel chapter three, when a giant statue was manufactured by King Nebuchadnezzar and all of the people were told to what? Bow down. When the symphonies and the music played, when the music of the media was telling you one narrative and you just go with it. No, no, no. These three Hebrew boys saying, no, we understand the law of our God as you shall have no other God before him. And we don't care if there's a sea of people bowing down. I don't care if all of my peer group is agreeing with it and doing it. I'm going to stand alone with Jesus rather than sit in a crowd without him. So whether it requires abstinence from, or as we'll see, eventually we'll get there, we'll get to the familiar and famous account of Daniel and the lions then, if it's allegiance to, abstinence from the world, or clear allegiance to the Lord, both predicate an obedience of the word. The mandates of divine law can be summed up in three different categories, gospel, praying, and worshiping. Now, there are nuances to those three categories. What is the mandate of divine law? That we should preach and teach and live the gospel no matter what the world says and no matter how they respond. Gospel living requires us to have, look at me, a beautiful boundary on sexuality and morality. It's beautiful. It's for our safety. It's for our security. It's actually for our prosperity. God has given us beautiful boundaries in the Bible. Gospel living requires you to abide in the word. So the word abides in you, lives in you. You give God more room and more space in your life. And then the Holy Spirit is given access to, as the Bible says, ready? Walk in the spirit. That's not like a Pentecostal weird thing. I'm fluttering and floating around in the spirit. No, when I walk in the spirit, I'm simply saying no to my flesh. And let me tell you something. My flesh wants to flare. My flesh gets provoked and my flesh wants to respond. And when I say no flesh and I go the other way, that's walking in the spirit. Gospel preaching. I will not stop preaching and teaching and speaking of the name of Jesus. I don't care who says I can't. Praying. And I said this before, maybe in your break room, you work in a very secular, hostile environment, and they say you can no longer pray in the break room, or you can no longer pray with a coworker. What do you do? I'm following the law of my work because I don't want to lose my livelihood. And I'm saying you just chose the fear of man over the fear of the Lord. And we see account after account of God taking care of his. And the final is worshiping or praising. When they say you can no longer come to church. You can no longer go to that church because that preacher is speaking hate speech. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not hate speech. It's just speech that they hate. And there's nothing more loving than telling people about a good God and hoping that they turn from their wicked ways. They turn from their sin. It's the word repentance and come to God because the wrath of God is on wicked man unless they turn to Christ, which is the love of God. It's the gospel. My brother was told in high school, invited to pray at one of the graduation services that he couldn't pray in the name of Jesus. You could pray, just don't pray in the name of Jesus. What'd he do? Well, he stepped to the podium and he prayed in the name of Jesus. Now, many would say that was 
defiant. That was disobedient. I'm going, no, you're not hearing what I'm saying. There's no such thing as defiance. It's called biblical obedience when you are preaching and teaching and living in the name of Christ. It's being tethered to truth and launched in love, right? Because the rule of integrity is what? That integrity rules. And tonight we're going to look at the grit of integrity. It takes grit. It's, it's the word courage when you look it up. It's the word zeal. It takes grit to follow through with integrity. So we looked at Daniel chapter 6 verses 1 through 5. And the main point based on Daniel's blamelessness is that integrity binds us to God's favor. You want God's favor on your life? comes through integrity. He who walks with integrity walks securely. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. That's Proverbs 11, verse 3. Integrity will bind you to God's favor, right? Think about that. When I walk on the path of righteousness, and and yes, I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall. I want to fall and fail forward. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to imperfectly execute the commandments of God. I'm going to stumble my way through them. But the point is, I'm moving forward. I'm going to slip up with the best of them. I'm not trying to be all holier than thou. My goal is to be holier for thou. So I fall forward, I fail forward, and I fall at the feet of my Savior who says, now get back up, and I'm with you this time. Do it again. And integrity binds me to God's favor. Tonight, we're going to look at how integrity doesn't bend under fire. Integrity does not bend under fire, under pressure. When we look at the life of Joseph, right there in the middle of his journey, he is an actual slave in the land of Egypt, and he has favor with his master, Potiphar, because integrity binds us to God's favor. And right there, Potiphar's wife makes a sexual pass at Joseph, a slave boy. And again, he had every reason to take advantage of his master's wife taking a pass at him. I mean, up to this point, he was forgotten by his family, betrayed, sold as a slave. If there was ever a man in the book who had a reason to go, listen, everything's going against me. I might as well take advantage of this one thing that seems to be going for me. The Bible says, no, Joseph, he fled. He ran away from the temptation. And I'm gonna be like Joseph because my eyes are on Jesus, that when temptation comes, I wanna not bend so that I don't break so that I don't compromise. And then we move to another character. His name's Job. In the first two chapters, the window of heaven is opened to us. We see an exchange between God and Satan. And of course, as it plays out, Satan's accusation is God. He's only blessing you because you protect him. And God at this point had said, you see Job, he's what? Blameless from last week. He's blameless. He cannot be blamed. And here's another character. He's upright. And he fears me and shuns evil. You can never fear God unless you begin to hate sin and and shun evil. God says, go ahead, have at it. At the end of the trial, please try to wrap your mind and your heart around what he lost. In the first chapter, he lost everything, his livelihood, his possessions, his 10 children. And there is no ache or pain or guilt, not, excuse me, guilt, grief, like losing a child on this planet. And I look out and I see, I see a mom who lost a son. And I see another mom who lost a son. And I see another mom who lost a son. And I see pain. But they would be the first to tell you that there's also joy that has sprouted from that sorrow because they know their savior. And in the midst of Job's trials, the one closest to him, the counterpart, the spouse, she comes and she says, are you really gonna hold to your, ready? Guess what the word is? Integrity. Curse God and die. He says, you speak like one of the foolish women speaks. Should we only accept good from God and not adversity? 
Chapter 2, it goes the same direction. The same exact direction, God says, look at Job. He holds to his integrity. And now we land on Daniel. Daniel in chapter 6, he is in his 80s. He has seen several different kings, rulers at this point. And here's the second world power to date. Babylon the Great has fallen at the end of Daniel chapter 5, approximately 539 B.C., by one year into the Medo-Persian Empire, King Darius under perhaps, and a lot of debate over this, I don't want to get lost in it, under the rule of Cyrus, he is now the last man standing because God never leaves himself without a witness. Daniel outlasted his captors. (laughs) And we see Daniel now up against, in chapter six, cancel culture. Uh Uh-oh, you thought that was something that is just happening in our present history? Oh, no, no. Cancel culture is a page out of the enemy's strategy book. Cancel culture, applying pressure to the Christian and the church. Even when cancel culture applies pressure, we see Daniel standing firm, immovable. Why? Because he stands on God's power. And if you haven't read the news lately, I am always happy to tell you what's going on. The latest target of cancel culture, you know it. Pepe Le Pew, oh yes, Looney Tunes character, a skunk who is accused of being a sexual deviant. And, and if you just said in response to that, yeah, he's, he's canceled. If you just said, man, that really stinks. <laughs> you ain't woke. <laughs> and, and I heard that when uh, Speedy Gonzalez heard, he said, he ain't worried about cancel culture because they ain't catching him. Verse six, so these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors, advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. All right, first thing to note is the word thronged. This is mob mentality. They come in numbers. Now, we're not sure if it's every single governor or satrap or administrator. They present it that way. It's very likely, because we know Daniel's absent, and he was one of the chief rulers over that group. We also can assume there were other rulers who weren't invited to this party. They also, they start with a very common phrase. It's a, it's a, it's a phrase of honor. King Darius, live forever. Right, we know where they're going. Their flattery is preceding their foolery. They got a plot. They got a plan. They've conspired. They've already come up with this idea that if they can get the law of Daniel's God to conflict with the law of their land, they are able to cancel Daniel permanently. The den of lions, of course, was one of the Medo-Persian ways of execution It's also noteworthy for us to see they told King Darius that he could be a god for 30 days. Right? They appeal to his flesh. Now, as the story unfolds, we'll eventually see King Darius, he is regretful over this decision because he had a heart for this Daniel. But in this moment, that he could be the one that all petitions must go through. King, you can be a God for 30 days. What say you? Now, there's something going on here in the scriptures. It is a parallel with what's happening against God's anointed one, the enemies of God against the anointed one. It is in Psalm chapter two, verses one through three. It says this, why do the nations rage and the people plot, conspire, throng a vain thing? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Translation, let us remove ourselves from their restraints. We no longer want accountability. We no longer want responsibility. We no longer want them, God, to define what we are doing with our lives. It is the heart behind relativism. 
You can't tell me what's right. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And that's pretty ridiculous considering that the laws of our, our roads are all operating on absolute truth. Without structure on our highways, when to stop, when to go, when to yield. That's absolutely truth. There are defining terms. Well, it's against God and his anointed. God sits in the heavens and he laughs. And he watches the plots of man unfold. And no matter what they try, they cannot undermine the purpose of God. We know this in Jesus' life specifically in Mark chapter 14 and Mark chapter 15. You're, you're going to see these scenes unfold. Judas had already made up his mind. The devil put it in his heart to betray Jesus. He goes to the religious leaders. He says, I can tell you where he's at. Now, this is the beginning of not only them bearing false witness against Jesus, this is the beginning of their plot unfolding. To this point, they attempted to trip him up in his words. They tried to get him to contradict or violate the law of the Romans. And every single time they came at Christ, I love Jesus, man. He gangster when it comes to this type of stuff. Never was he ruffled. He was always calm, cool, and collected. And of course, we often excuse that away as, oh, he's just God. I'm going, you don't understand. He was fully man and fully God, truly man and truly God. He was completely in reliant upon the spirit. He didn't want to speak unless his father said speak. So they take Jesus by night. Where do they take him? Caiaphas's court. This is against the proper procedure of trying a man. They do it after hours. They are sneaky like a snake. And they then, they try to get Jesus to confess to blaspheming God. They bear false witness. It says that their testimonies, they were not in, in alignment. And eventually they said, you know what? He said he's gonna destroy the temple. And in three days, he'll rebuild it. Well, he did say that, but he said it about his body. He was talking about the temple of his body. They eventually take him to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and they present Jesus. This is the mob mentality. They present Jesus, the perfect son of God who had done no wrong to not a single person. And he is before his accusers. And even Pontius Pilate begins to see they're up to something. There's jealousy here. They wanna take this guy out. And, and of course, we know how this unfolds. Well, how's it unfold? Are you on the edge of your seat? Well, this is the spoiler alert. The spoiler alert is that man's plots fall perfectly into God's plans. It doesn't matter what they attempted, what they tried. In fact, God ordained it. So though they thought they were taking Jesus by their hands, they were simply carrying out the will of God because God was gonna put his son on that cross for even those that accused him and that betrayed him and that crucified him. So I received that prayer he prayed on the cross because I'm, I'm just as compliant. I am just as guilty. I am complicit in the murdering of God's son. And I think if you don't own that, you will never have a healthy understanding of the sacrifice of Jesus, that we put him there, our sin, my sin. And when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That forgiveness was extended to me. And now based on the mercy I know, that's gonna be the mercy I show. Likewise, the cross would become the tool God chose to salvage sinful man Verse eight, now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Okay, comparatively, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar the Great, that was a complete monarchy. Translation, whatever he said went. He was the law. He could say something, enact it, and he could retract it. That's a complete monarchy. Monarchy. Now we move into the Medo-Persian Empire. It's not a complete monarchy. It's a constitutional monarchy. That word constitution should give rise to the understanding of our American government. We are a constitutional democracy. The constitution is the supreme law of the land. The law of the Medes and Persian, their constitution was the supreme law of the land. If he signed it and enacted it, he himself couldn't change it. He could not 
alter it. Now, I read that and I stopped and I went, oh my goodness, isn't it similar that when something is signed into law, perhaps it's irreversible. And perhaps there are things that happen in our world, our life, that can't be changed, that are irreversible. Perhaps losing a loved one. Can't reverse that. Can't change it. Perhaps a diagnosis from the doctor, cancer, that lump, we need to do a biopsy on it. Can't reverse some of these decisions, some of these situations. But the second part of this is that even though to man, you and I, circumstances may not be irreversible, we serve a God whose ability to redeem all circumstances supersedes, superintends those previously listed things. How so, Matt? I lost a son, I lost a loved one, I lost a spouse, I lost a parent, I lost a child. You're telling me God can redeem that? Yes, if you lost them and they knew the Lord, then their life isn't necessarily able to come back to this temporal world, but God has redeemed them. He's recycled them. And I know that I could speak on behalf of my mom at least and Sharon and Lisa, that as much as you long for them, you don't wanna take them from where, from where they are. You wanna be where they are because that's what makes you want Jesus even more. So I said last Thursday that Jesus is not a means to get to heaven. That might've confused some of us. I thought he was. No, no. Heaven's a means to get back to Jesus. I wanna to go to heaven because that's where Jesus is. Decisions that you may have made in your past that cannot be reversed, cannot change them. Things that have happened to you, unspeakable, cannot reverse them. You don't even wanna go there in your memory. I have a day like that. It was March 7th, 2009. This past Sunday was 12 years. That anniversary, every single year, I can taste the nausea based on my decision. I can't reverse that. I can't go back and take it back. Redeemed? Because out of all the days on the calendar, it just so happened to be on March 7th, this past Sunday, that God allowed my wife and I to welcome into this world my son Ezekiel. March 7th, 2009. And I watched 11.59 p.m. in the laboring room. As it turned over to 12, I could not believe. And the difference from March 7th, 2009 to March 7th, 2021 is the description of my son's name, Ezekiel. God is my strength. Amen. Not to mention fathers in that particular arena are completely useless. <laughs> As I watched my warrior wife Bring to life Hebrews that says we labor in love. You talk about giving of your body to produce a life. I mean, that is a perfect example of what Jesus Christ did. He gave of his body. He was selfless. He was self-sacrificial to give of himself so that a life could be birthed, the church. Say that if there's none like a mom, there's none like my wife, incomparable Sarah, to watch her go through that and continue that process. The moms in here, you know what I'm talking about. Let's get back in the text. You guys are getting carried away up here. <laughs> Verse 10, now when Daniel, ready? When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. When Daniel knew the executive order was signed, when Daniel knew the decision from the courts was eventually gonna come to the 
community. When Daniel knew that the legislation, the new bill, the proposal has passed through Congress and it would eventually touch his congregation, it says Daniel, he went home. He went home in defeat. He went home in retreat. He knew what to do, right? Just for 30 days, Daniel, stay under the radar. Daniel, you're at the edge and end of your career. You've been at this for over 70 years. You just have a little bit longer. Just don't rock the boat, Daniel. Daniel, stay in your lane. Daniel, you want to survive, don't you? And all of these ideas are the compromising attitude of Christian pragmatism. You know what it means to be pragmatic? It's a good thing. It means you look at practical outcomes. You measure with reason, you know, if one plus two equals three, if one, the law was signed, if two, I don't abide by the law, equals three, I'll be thrown into a lion's den. That's pragmatism. And I don't wanna get thrown into the lion's den, so of course, abide by law. Christian pragmatism, however, disqualifies the miracle. Christian pragmatism, however, completely removes God from the equation. Because sometimes, like Daniel chapter 3, it would have been pragmatic to just bow down and stick and stay out of the way, out of harm. But they said, no, no, we're not going to bow down. We believe our God can deliver us. We believe our God will deliver us. But even if he chooses not to deliver us, not so pragmatic. Daniel would have been better off not becoming a victim of their evil plot, right? No, because we are never victims of integrity. In fact, you can only be a victor from integrity, right? Those that are serving Christ, being persecuted for righteousness sake, they're not victims. Jesus said that blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are those who are reviled and slandered and falsely accused of evil. Jesus said, for my sake, blessed are they. That don't sound like a victim to me. He's saying, no, that's a victor. That man or that woman is standing for me. Did you know there's a pastor in Canada, Edmonton, that is currently in prison as I preach this message because that province said that he's defied health orders. He had his people coming together. And of course they slapped a fine on him. He still gathered and congregated because he recognized there are statistics that aren't being talked about. 300 and 400% increases to depression and suicide and drug use and abuse. And all of this is because we're told to stay home because of a virus that has a 99.9% survivability rate. Now you got people walking around with three masks. (laughs) That's not in my notes. (laughs) Integrity does what is righteous regardless of the consequence. Integrity does what is righteous regardless of the consequence. Interestingly, I spent 18 months on one housing unit in jail. It was two east. It is on two east that I was able to uh, spend time with former NBA all-star Jason Williams. Just was on the phone this morning because he needed pictures, pictures that we had stored from jail. So I'm going through my my storage and I find these pictures and I'm going to provide them for Jason because he's about to do an HBO documentary. And I'm, I'm reminded of my experience with him. Him and I were leading a Bible study and of course we were walking people through the scriptures and we were hoping to see lives changed. In fact, we saw more than lives changed. We saw the culture change. Now we weren't trying to change the laws of the prison, but we were responsible while we were there to be salt and light and affect the place that God had placed us. Don't stay to yourself. Don't stay in your lane. Well, long story short, a certain supervisor despised us, hated us. Maybe that's what happened in Daniel chapter six, verses one through five, when your efficiency highlights somebody else's deficiency, when maybe your success or your smile or your joy highlights somebody's misery. I don't know what it was, but they decided to move us, separate us, and they chose me. And here I am sent upstairs on March 7th, 2011. My whole world rocked. Up to that point, I'm comfortable, I have my routine, I got my people, I know exactly what I'm up against on my housing unit, and now I'm moved to the hardest housing unit in the jail. You better believe, as I walked up the steps, 
I'm fighting with God. I'm arguing. I, I served you on that housing unit. I stepped out and started a Bible study. God, what are you doing? And I'll never forget it. I heard a still small voice. Oh, here we go. He heard God speak. No, no, no. When you know the word, it, it just it resonates inside of you. And God said, take root where I've planted you. So I got upstairs and I started another Bible study. And more people were coming to the Lord. And eventually one day as we're praying, grown men holding hands on a housing unit, we're, we're told that we must move, get out of the way. And, and they're cursing. And, and I open my, my one eye and I see it's a sergeant and he's literally waiting for us to disperse so he can walk through and check you know, the fire distinguisher and, and, and the, the, the hazards of the door and secure it, all this process. And, and my friend who's praying, he looks at me and I say, keep praying. And he continued to pray, no more than three to five seconds. Amen. We sat down. The sergeant walked off. Mayor, come with me. Well, I'll tell you what happened to fast track the story. They eventually decided to do two things. Move me from that housing unit back downstairs. And then the, the very next day, a memo went out throughout the whole institution. A memo on the front board of our housing unit saying, you are no longer allowed to congregate around the tables. That's where we did our Bible study because it would be considered inciting a riot. So the very next day I got my Bible, I went over to the table and I said, Bible study up, Bible study up. Because I wasn't gonna allow a man to dictate whether or not I open this book and teach people it. Uh oh, by the way, I landed back on Two East, the unit I started my journey on. And God was giving me an opportunity to see with new eyes, fresh eyes, how far he had taken me up to this point, four years and three months. And I sat at a table that I had sat at when I first got to jail and I saw it with brand new eyes. I say again, man's plot falls perfectly into God's plans. And what we might see as irreversible, God sees as redeemable. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. Okay, uh, this is how I study. This is how I write the messages. I can't get past certain phrases in his upper room. This was a common place of devotion, a common place of relaxation, a common place for petitioning and praying with his windows open toward Jerusalem. Now, I wanna tie this to the ancient scrolls, those two words, toward Jerusalem. I wanna tie it to the ancient scrolls and then to the scripture as a whole. This toward Jerusalem, where does it come from? Well, Psalm 122, the entire chapter written by David is a, is a song of ascent to God on behalf of Jerusalem. One of the verses says this, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. In other words, those that love Israel and Jerusalem, the throne of God, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of peace, the foundation of peace towards Jerusalem. And then Solomon, 400 plus years earlier in dedication of the temple, he said this unbelievable prayer. Read it on your own time. First Kings chapter eight. He says this prayer of dedication and he basically highlights the fact that we're gonna sin. And every time we sin, we should turn back to the temple, the presence of God, call out to heaven so that we, we can receive again the favor of God. And then he gets to this portion, verse 46 and 48. Listen to this. This is Solomon. When they sin against you, God, for there's no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near, yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive saying, we have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul and the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land, which you have given to their fathers, the city, Jerusalem, which you have chosen and the temple, which I have built for your name. Daniel knew the scriptures. Daniel is facing Jerusalem. Now that's religion. Religiously speaking, that's how I explained it. Now, spiritually speaking, Jesus is our Jerusalem. You can come to the Father when you are facing Jesus. You can go before the Father because you've placed Jesus before you. Toward Jesus spiritually. Then there's a third explanation here. Toward Jerusalem prophetically. There are so many verses from the prophets from the Old Testament that point to Israel and Jerusalem as the stage 
of God's return. All of the world should be watching the Middle East. You should be aware of what's happening in the Middle East. In fact, the prophetic time clock, according to scriptures, I believe God started again after Ezekiel 37. The prophet said, there's this valley of dry bones, they're dead. And God says, my spirit is gonna revive them. He was speaking of his people. And on May 14th, 1948, the Israelites were given back their nation. So you go like this, what's gonna happen next? They get their capital back, Jerusalem, 1967. The past administration honored the fact that Jerusalem is their capital. The past administration signed into um, uh, the Abraham Accords, brokering peace in the Middle East. That's Ezekiel chapter 38. Because in Ezekiel 38, after they come back to their land, when they're at peace on all sides, this is when eventually from the north, you got countries like Iran and you got countries like Syria and Turkey, they will eventually converge and perhaps even Russia. Converge on who? Israel. And we are watching it unfold in 2021. Are you aware of that? Towards Jerusalem, prophetically. Towards Jerusalem, politically. That's the stage of the geopolitical arena. Now back to the actual context. Daniel, notice, he doesn't, open his windows. It says with his windows open. He, he does, he's not going out of his way to be defiant, to be rebellious, nor does he close his windows. He's not about to be cowardice. He is about to be courageous. Why? Because when man's laws contradict God's laws, civil disobedience is biblical obedience. To Daniel, the presence of God was greater than the consequence of man. The very presence of God Psalm 118, verse six, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. Verse eight, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Notice here, Daniel is not worried about who sees him. He's not worried about cancel culture. And clearly he understands the terms of the decree. He's not fearing the lion's ability to devour, nor should we. There are various lions, of course. In scripture, we'll see lions who lie. Lion lions, you get that? Like a lion lion. These liars are the offspring of their father. John 8, 44 says the devil is a father of lies. Why are you responding to those that are slandering you, lying on you, as if you're gonna be able to convince them otherwise? Why are you spending time debating and arguing on Facebook? Did you ever notice if you follow me, I don't reply to anybody on Facebook? That is not the forum to convince a troll. Trolls a person that pops up and begins to sow discord. Don't worry about the lions. And there's also lions who lie in wait. Lions who lie in wait. You know what lion wait is? Lie in wait. It's actually what lions and, and predators do. They hide in the brush and they watch. And when their prey comes by, full ambush. They catch their prey off guard. Here's a verse for you, Psalm 10, about the wicked. The wicked lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. So what are we to do? I'll tell you, when our enemies pray, we pray for our enemies. When our enemies conspire, Jesus said, pray for them. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You love those who hate you. You bless those who curse you. I can't do that. That's the point. You're gonna need my spirit to execute mercy. You try to do it in your own flesh. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees, 80 some years old, three times that day, prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Okay, what is the secret to his grit? This takes grit. He goes home. He faces Jerusalem. He gets on his knees the whole day, three times. He prays. We don't know what he prayed. And he gave thanks. Psalm 55, 16 and 17. Perhaps he knew what David used to do. As for me, I will call upon God. The Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray. And I will cry aloud and he shall hear me. Hey, listen, whether it's setting your, your, your watch or your iPhone to certain times, just as reminders to perhaps throw your mind heavenward. 
in the midst of a busy day, in the midst of a crazy work week. I'm wondering if we're finding the rhythms of prayer and devotion. Daniel, I'm certain, had a lot on his plate. He was one of the chief governors over a kingdom. And yet at 80 some years of age, under threat of consequences, he found time to pray three times that day. For us, I just simply say the beginning, the during, and the ending of my day, right? I begin my day with prayer. That's the first book. I end my day in prayer. That's the book end. And as I go throughout my day, I wanna be conscious that while I'm talking to you perhaps in the grocery store and we're talking about you know, Ezekiel and how Sarah's doing, as soon as I'm done that conversation, I want my mind to be cast back to Calvary. And as I walk out that store, I wanna say, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. And, and this is how you cultivate a relationship with your God. And it, it starts where? Right here. That the frequency of our stops will determine the fervency of our steps. Like how often you get with God. I was back there and Katie said something from the stage earlier. And Pastor Matt said, that's right. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here and you're all facing forward and you're listening to Katie. And, and that's all Pastor Matt said from the back. That's right. And in the sea of people, one person turned around. It was Pastor Matt's son, Jesse. You wanna know why? Because he recognized his father's voice. Do you recognize your father's voice? In the midst of so much noise and chatter, do you recognize your father's voice? Let me replace the word. The intimacy of our stops will determine the integrity of our steps. Verse 10, as was his custom since early days. The decree was signed. Daniel's not doing anything new. He's not being defiant. He's not saying, you know what? I'll show them. I'll go home. I'll throw my windows open and I'm gonna pray. No, he's not doing that. This is what he had always done. This was the pattern of Daniel's life. This is Daniel's rhythm. This is not religion. This is harmony. This is Daniel using prayer, not as a foxhole, but as a keyhole. You know what a foxhole is, right? It's a dugout on a battlefield when the enemy is coming in and there's gunfire, you dive into the closest ditch. And that's where this idea of a foxhole prayer came from. You're down and out. You're in the midst of crisis and you're finally turning to God and going, God, if you are real, help me. And I'm going, uh, that's okay. But usually what happens is because there's no intimacy and no depth in a relationship like that, you go through the crisis, you call out to God. And as soon as you get your life back in order, you forget about him. I've seen it. I've seen people sit in the sanctuary, tell me I'm going through this pastor and they're broken, so it seems, and they're wanting more of God. And then as soon as you hear their life's back together, their spouse returned, their kids came home, I never see them again. Cosmic jackpot. Daniel's rhythm was in alignment with the pace of God. And when you're in alignment with the pace of God, your steps will be ordered by the peace of God. You can see when somebody is imprisoned by peace. Their hearts and their minds are guarded by peace. In the midst of a storm, there's all this movement and chaos around them and they are at peace. Daniel must have been at peace. This was his custom. This was his habit. This was what he did. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Here's the final point. To become complacent in the reading and the heeding of scripture is to become compliant with the culture. When you stop getting alone with God, frequent and intimate interactions in the book, you might not say that you're compliant with the culture, but I'll tell you, as goes the stream, the current, as goes your flesh, as goes the carnality of man. The Christian is called to swim upstream, to go against the grain, to not conform to the world, to be sanctified, set apart, to be a light, to be salt, to pray our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth where you've placed me 
as it's already fulfilled, established in heaven. So this is what I wanna say. The end game for the Christian and for the church is not permanence. I am not trying to usher in God's kingdom. That's not gonna happen. He's gonna do that. He's gonna do that eventually. He's gonna set all things straight. He's gonna exact all justice. He's coming back. But in the meantime, my role and responsibility is to be a preservative. Not about permanence. When people think, oh, you're, you're trying to you know, change America with your political preaching. And I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to do what Jesus said I should do. Be a salt, the salt of the earth. It was a preservative. Salt was used to pack fishes and meat so that it wouldn't decay. It would eventually decay, but the salt slowed down the decay. So my role and goal as a Christian is to delay the decay of the day by being in the way. The, the church is a wall. The, ch the church is a dam. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, it's the church. We just stand in the way. We just hold it back until the Bible says God is gonna remove the church. You ever been in traffic and you get up there and you, figure, you find out it was nothing but a stinking turtle and everybody just was stopping and waiting? I said, that's the Christian. I'm just taking my time and I'm gonna be in the way until the day that the Lord takes me out of the way. All right. How do you end a message like this? <laughs> well, you reiterate the title. This is God over government, the grit of integrity. God over government. And with this message, I just became a target. But my role and goal is to challenge and charge the church to be mindful that our integrity binds us to God's favor True biblical integrity never bends under fire. We are reminded that our God is in complete control. Spoiler alert, man's plots, they will fall perfectly into God's plans. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it tonight, let's do it. So let's do something different. I want you to stand with me. We're gonna, we're gonna close in a, a song of worship and a song of ascent, right, Gabe? And I'd ask right now that you would consider where you stand with the Lord and make a determination tonight how you're gonna go deeper in your faith. I don't know what that looks like. I mean, it, it could very well be something as practical and simple as the posture that you've taken in church. I say this again, even throwing your hands up, a man in here who has never done that, and I get it, it, it seems undignified. You know what I do for a living? I'm not gonna do that. And I really just wanna call you deeper. Upward worship is about surrendering. Right? Just throwing your hands up for the first time. I guarantee you, I promise you this, it will be the most liberating thing you've done all week. You know what will happen? The fear of man that you are living by will completely melt away. Maybe that's the practical takeaway. That's courage over compromise. I'm gonna do this. Maybe it's singing for the first time. I love hearing Leon sing. Love hearing Katie sing. Love hearing Gabe sing. I love our worship team. But they're not singing to perform. They're simply singing to stir up emotions, right? Because that's biblical. That's what music does. I've seen some of you back in your Woodstock days, moving and grooving on the field. <laughs> Aunt D. <laughs> and now you're all stoic up in church. Right? That's what I think about. Right? Your, your pastor used to frequent the clubs. And I would bob to the music. And when I got out and I gave my life to Christ and I came to church and I was like, thinking about that, unashamed in that area. When will I make the transition to be unashamed in this area? All right, I'm getting into part three now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this assembly. I thank you for every single person here and online. Would you do what only you can do? Because you're a man of your word. Would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you make your face shine upon them. God, would you lift up your countenance to them? Would you be gracious as you are? 
Would you give us your peace? And we thank you for your son, Jesus. We sing to him, toward him, toward our peace. In Jesus' name, amen.